Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the LA Film Festival, the programmers, and especially the volunteers who really make these things work the way they do. So when you see a volunteer, be nice to them. Um, this film, I'm so happy to be able to show you this film finally after, uh, after, I don't know, seven or eight years that I worked on it. And there's so many people in the audience here that worked or had something to do with the film. And it was just as much a labor of love for them as it was for me. <laughs> So, I hope you enjoy it, and I think we do a Q&A afterwards. Enjoy the film. At this point, I'd like to bring back down Derek Bort, and he'll bring down any other folks he wants to share the stage with. Woo! Sondergaard, producer, Tom Butterfield, producer. Woo! Okay, so in your opening remarks, you mentioned the long journey of making the film. Can you collectively um, tell us about how the project came to life? You were here before me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I used to run the film division of Sony Music, and my mandate was to make music-driven films with Sony artists, and so The Clash was one of the catalog uh, artists on the label, so everyone I spoke to would always tell about when they were a kid and they heard The Clash, or when they had met Joe Strummer, how they didn't wash their hands for days, and you know, so many stories like that, so the idea came about to really do a, a movie about the influence of, of Joe Strummer and The Clash rather than a biopic of the band. So that's how it how it all started. Um, and for you as a director, what was the most challenging and also the most rewarding thing about directing a period piece? This specific period piece, I think it was just about getting the getting it right in re in regards to to the band, because not only casting a band that could play and, and that were the right actors, but also I didn't want them to be you know have a lip sync thing where they were they were trying to sing to original class tracks. I just thought that would be really the wrong thing to do. So putting a band together, then recording all of them, and and just trying to get the music right was the most challenging part and, and the most rewarding part. And you mentioned casting just now, so your cast was incredible. <laughs> um, how did you go about finding the kids? And tell us how that went. Wow, I, I think that the the kids were were challenging, obviously, because I think you know at one point because we had an eight year development process on this, we had this amazing kid cast, and then he all of a sudden two years later was six foot five and couldn't play the role anymore. So it's the true true story. So um, I just think it was uh, a combined effort that somehow fell into place for us and, and you know each role was different but it really was just a lot of work and trying to find the right people and, and we feel very fortunate to, to have the cast that we do. Wonderful. Um, and a great casting director, Celestia Fox. Ah. <laughs> um, so what was, for all of you, your favorite moment during filming? Uh, I think um, it was two moments, if I'm allowed to. Um, the first one was uh, was the first day of, of the rehearsal scene with Johnny and the band. Um, and having Daniel kind of be there and, and his reaction to them playing um, was, was stunning. And and my personal favorite was, was with him and his sister. Um, when we have the moment that she turns around and says, we're fucked. Um, <laughs> because it's just so honest and so lovely. And she delivers it so well, and his reaction is, is brilliant. So I think that's probably my, my two. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think the scene where he goes to see the Clash for the first time, that was in a very small club, and Johnny was so into it that it was like being at a Clash concert. And one of our investors who's here tonight, who's been to many Clash shows, you know, the biggest compliment we could get was he felt like he was at a Clash show. <laughs> So that was, that was, we felt like, okay, we're doing the right thing here. I think my favorite 
moment, absolutely, bar none, is is the rehearsal scene when 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 Johnny brings him to the uh, to the rehearsal hall. We invited I invited Ray Gange out, who's a who's a pretty well known guy. If you're a Clash fan, he's the the lead in in Rude Boy. He was good friends with Joe in the band, and this is 1978, and he's an extra in the film. And I invited him out to that scene just to, that 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 day to uh, to just watch. And right when we started shooting, I, I could see him over over uh, off to the side and, and and I could tell that he was he was happy he was into it and then uh, after after we cut I went over and just asked him how he was doing and he said that the hair on the back of his neck was standing up and that it brought him back to the first time Joe brought him to rehearsal to meet the guys and and he really just said we captured the essence of it and and he was just so moved by sort of being taken back in time to, to that moment in his life so now I'd like to open it up to the audience. If you have any questions, um, I can't really see. You were there, right there. Well, I walked up and down. What's the the street with all the guitar shops and it's outside? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I walked up and down all the guitar shops in Soho and just started talking to people and, and asking. For, for suggestions of guys that might be great musicians that that uh, might have the right look and and uh, and it started there and then I found Dave Page who played Mick Jones in the film and then we did we, we had a, a larger group and he and I did sort of a big all day band practice and just sort of auditioned these guys until we fit the band together so they are all, all actually playing all of this um, and it was a it was a fun process. Can't really see. Okay. Um, anybody? No question. You right there. Uh, what was it like watching Johnny emulate uh, Joe? It was amazing. I mean, I think yeah, it was. It, I mean, I, I know I can speak for myself. It was. Uh, this project was a dream project for me, and uh, in fact, I got involved. Um, my agent was asking me, what is your dream project? He's here, Doug. Where are you, Doug McLaren? He said, what's your dream project? And I just threw it out there. I'd love to find a project about a kid discovering the clash. And I just felt like there's never, there's not a movie like that. And he said, you're not going to believe this, but there's a project like this. And I, and I read it and, and met with Sophia. And so seeing Johnny portray Joe was just this, this, the culmination of eight years of work and this dream, this dream that we all had so it was pretty special, I guess, to give you a long-winded answer to that. What do you hope folks take away from seeing the film? It's got political undertones. It's got it's complicated. It's it's wonderful. What do you want people to? Donald Trump's in the movie. Yeah, you know. I, I mean, I hope that it's a it's a great it's a great way for me to introduce my kids to the to to the Clash, but it's also. The issues that, are, that the film addresses parallel the issues we're dealing with today so well with politics and racial and social issues that, that I hope it just is a conversation starter. Right there? No? Who do you think is the most audience for this film? Go ahead, Tom. I'll answer that. Um, in all honesty, without being uh, too ridiculous, I kind of think everyone, uh, because I, when I was brought onto this project, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of youngster in, in the group in terms of uh, being involved. But when I read it, I, I always saw it as something that my mum and dad would watch on a Sunday night. My sister and I would be there a bit younger, you know, potentially maybe squeezing in a cheeky glass of wine if my parents were allowed. And my younger brother, who's a bit younger, and each of us would get something different from it for different reasons. Uh, for my parents, because they were that generation, I was a little bit later, and so for them it would be that time, that period, that music. Uh, for me and, and, and my generation, it would be a, you know, a boy coming of age and his first love and his relationship with his father. Um, and then for my little brother, it would be you know, the, the younger sister. So I think it's it's one of those films that when you come out of it, you come out of it with a smile on your face. And each generation kind of gets a different love for it for a different reason. Um, so yeah, I think it kind of, for me, it kind of covers all the bases. You right there? Yeah. Um, first, congratulations on the film, and uh, it's a wonderful 
news I, I saw earlier tonight about it. Um, you talked about the eight-year process. Could you talk about some of the obstacles along the way that you thought would derail the film, but that you were able to overcome? So I, uh, I'll, there are many, but we'll <laughs> keep it brief. So there were a first set of writers, and then there was Matt Brown, who's here tonight and should stand up. He didn't want to do the Q&A, but he wrote, you know, what you've seen tonight. And, um, you know, then we had to get the music, which is, you know, The Clash has never given this much music to anything. Um, so that was, you know, helpful that I was obviously with Sony Music, who has the masters, but we also had to get the publishing. And then, you know, just to get something like this financed, like any other movie, it was just, you know, a challenge. Um, and my buddy Tom over here <laughs> was very helpful in getting that accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> I've been told we have time for one more question. Right here. Hi. I feel this is a very naive question, stupid even. And I just moved back from the UK. I don't know the answer. Why were the police involved in every crash? There were always fights between them. Sorry. Yeah. There, were Sorry. Always, there were always fights between the punks and the skinheads um, at that time. That it was all kind of part of a big kind of melting pot between punk skinheads, Rastafarians, uh, the police, the neo-Nazis. It was all kind of a big socio-political nightmare, really. Um, and so generally when The Clash played, that you know, it brought a huge punk movement with it, which in turn brought skinheads to get into a ruckus. Sure. And um, reminder, you have ballots, remember to vote. We're going to continue the conversation. They're going to be in the lobby after the film for just a few minutes. So if you want to say congratulations or ask any more questions. Um, I just wanted to address real quick her, uh, the question Sophia answered. One, one of the biggest obstacles to me by far was that The Clash had to approve the film. They had to read the script and say yes to all of this music and bless this. And I remember when we sent the script off, it was just a few like days of just waiting. Did they call months? Did they call? Did they call? And when they when they called and 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 gave us all of these songs, which really they've never done before, that was really the biggest obstacle that that we have, were able to get through. Yeah. So, um, yes. And now we have a distributor. IFC Films bought the film today. Thank you very much for coming out. Remember to vote. Um, so collect the balance at the door, and like I said, uh, these folks will be in the lobby for a few minutes after the screen.